Hi, welcome to MediatorPodcast.com, a podcast and video series about mediation, negotiation, and collaboration. My name is Melissa Gregg, and I provide online valuation, divorce, and mediation services based out of St. Louis, Missouri. In this week's episode, we're actually going to discuss a book written by our guest, Kimberly Best, How to Live Forever, A Guide to Writing the Final Chapter of Your Life Story. She's a registered nurse, a mediator, and conflict coach based in Franklin, Tennessee, and has authored this book that we're going to discuss today. In TV and in movies, we've kind of created this, you know, Mm. real, um, I don't know, euphoria at the end and things like that. And instead of real conversations that are happening, it's, you know, and, and it is an opportunity that people don't necessarily want to take on, right? Because it's, it's uncomfortable to talk about death. It's uncomfortable to read about death, but what kind of things did you do in this book to even help people to even get to that place? You know, you know, it's hard to get there. So you had to create kind of the tools, you know, Mm -hmm. what did you do so that people could kind of incorporate this into their process? That's uh, that's such a good question. What I did was tell stories of people that I've seen go through it. Some some who hit it out of the ballpark and some who really struggled, knowing it's a struggle for all of us. I mean, it wasn't easy for the people who put in the work. It just made for an easier ending. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I tried to normalize it. You know, um, make it okay to talk about, make it okay. Like everything else we do in life, it's an experiment. Like we've never walked through this before, each Mm -hmm. of us, right? You may walk through it with someone else, but with each person, it's different. So it's always a new moment and a new moment is an experiment. So giving yourself grace, giving the other person grace, but focusing on, like for me, I really take this, I'm living my story seriously. Mm-hmm. And I I tried to use the we're helping someone else live their story. And like you said, Melissa, um, in the book, I also have a chapter on what you can leave as your story and how to leave your story, including the conversations. Um, I did a survey on what family members want to know um, that they don't know about family members that have already passed. So what do you wish you had known? So there's an opportunity to have discussions around just your story. What were things like when you were a kid? What do you wanna say in your goodbye? Mm -hmm. Um, So I think keeping it in the context of a story makes it easy. Uh, If we look at our own lives as a story, which indeed they are a series of stories, right? And Mm -hmm. wanting to end that as well as possible, I think makes it easier to have those conversations than, oh gosh, now we got to talk about us dying. It's no, Mm -hmm. that's going to show up in our story. And what do we want it to look like? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that that is kind of the counterbalance to what people say. Like, I don't, you know, I, I think when somebody passes in your family, especially if it's a close person, then you're like, okay, what would I do things different? What would I like different? You know, uh, and then you just start telling people, well, uh, if, if, if something like this happens to me, then do A, B, and C. And then they say, okay, well, you know, let's talk about, it. well, I don't want to really talk about it. That's right. I just want, I just want to tell you three things, you know? So I, I, I actually think that when something like that happens, it might be a good time to reach out and get a book like this. Be like, you know, I don't want to have this be happening when I'm 85. Like, why don't we talk about these things now so that everybody can be on the same page? And I also think generationally, we view death different Mm -hmm. than maybe our predecessors, our ancestors, you know, our grandparents, our parents and things like that. So, you know, maybe to, um, to bring some more conversation about it with our own children, you know, That's and right. because they're going through this process too. And, and part of it is even maybe to heal so that you don't have to wait until, you know, the death of that person to then start the grieving process or the healing process. 
That's absolutely beautiful. And you're right. And you're right about the generational part of that as well, which I think we're going backwards on. Hmm. And that's because of medicine, right? Our expectations for medicine are this isn't supposed to happen to me or anyone I know. And it wasn't like that before. So, so everything has a price, right? And, and as I mentioned earlier, the price for living longer is it's harder to die. Mm -hmm. And it's taking longer to die. And we need to think about that in making our decisions. Um, people are suffering for longer in death for that. So we, we just need to be aware of not just what we know, but what we don't know as well in order to make in, as informed decisions as possible. Well, and I think that if, if you did have more conversations about this, you would understand what hospice really looks like or what some of those things actually look like, because there is more, you know, like I kind of perceived that hospice would come in and mm. everything, you know, like there'd be a person there all the time. They'd be telling us what to do. Like we're just, they're like, you know, making s'mores and telling stories and like enjoying the person. But there's a lot that happens physically in the body at the end of the of life, there's a lot that happens in the mind. And I think that even being prepared for that progression, mm -hmm. and then the unknown is how long is this going to last, right? And so I think that that having those discussions about who is going to be involved with that, because it does mm -hmm. take people, it does take bodies, it takes, you know, helping, and it can't all rest on a few family members, because it really is a, a, um, you know, maybe not what everybody envisions. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it isn't. Every time is different. Yeah. And, uh, and the unknowns, I mean, I know you know this, Melissa, but from moment to moment, well, walking my own dad through this, I called my family three times and said, he's not going to make it another night. And then, and then he would, I mean, our expectations without knowing what it could be, it's hard. And it's mm -hmm. hard. It was hard for me as a nurse, knowing that anything could happen mm -hmm. when literally anything did happen. I mean, mm -hmm. it is tough. It is hard. Um, and, but knowing what's going to happen. And I think hospice does a really good job of trying to prepare families uh, for, for what it's going to look like, but each experience is unique. It mm -hmm. is. And, um, and you don't know when or what or how, mm -hmm. and that's just what the story looks like. And I think mo more often than not, families want to, you know, go through the process at their house Mm -hmm. And in surrounded by people that they love. Um, but I think that that's also a process. Like, it, it, you right. know, it's just kind of, I mean, I'm a little bit more business utilitarian kind of person. So I was just like, it would have been helpful. If somebody, yeah. you know, because now you're grieving, you're trying to help somebody pass, but you're also having like, people want to come in and out, you know, like you, people want to do things for you. But you're like, I don't even have time to tell you what you need to do for me. You know, so it's really, I think it's just really starting to create a different way that we view all of this as opposed to like, something's going to happen in a hospital and, you know, I'll show up for the funeral or something, you know, it's, it's, th there's a lot more involved that we think that maybe somebody's just going to take care of, 